Hello, I'm Ruxandra Jorkuts. I'm the coordinator of the Expert Center for Rare Genetic Cardiovascular Diseases in the Emergency Institute for Cardiovascular Diseases of Bucharest, Romania. I will talk about Fabri cardiomyopathy and uh, I will discuss the aspects of diagnostic challenges and uh, what is important to know about therapy of this disease for the cardio. Fabri disease has an X-linked transmission, which means males are hemizygotes and are mainly affected. But we know now that due to mosaicism, or what is called lionization, women can also express the disease. The mutation on the X chromosome leads to the absence of a lysosomal enzyme, which is called the alpha-galactosidase A. Due to the intracellular accumulation of the globotriazole ceramide, there are changes in several organs. We can easily see the changes of the skin, and you can see here angiokeratomas. The heart suffers with left ventricular or biventricular hypertrophy, together with patches of fibrosis. In any organ, histology can show the presence of um, global triazole ceramides and lipids inclusion, but electron microscopy is very good at describing the presence of what is called the zebra bodies. When the kidneys are affected, chronic kidney disease can ensure and proteinuria is usually the first sign. Neurological signs include acroparesthesia, which are painful symptoms of the extremities, some of the first symptoms to occur, but it can also lead to stroke. As this is a storage disease, the first years of childhood and early adolescence don't show much of any organ involvement except for the acroparesthesia. After the adolescence, all the organs affected can begin to manifest their signs and symptoms, and tissular changes are followed later if not treated by organ failure. At the level of the heart, several changes were described. First, there is the lipid storage. Globotriazole ceramide can accumulate in the cardiomyocytes as well as in the conduction system cells, the valvular fibroblasts, endothelial cells and vascular smooth muscle cells. However, they were proven to account for less than 5% of the whole cardiac mass, meaning they lead to hypertrophy as well as to fibrosis, also by triggering intracellular signaling pathways. The localized thing of the left ventricular basal posterior wall is linked to localized fibrosis but also inflammation. If there is myocardial ischemia, it is usually not the result of large coronary artery disease but mostly of endothelial dysfunction of coronary arteries as well as to increased oxygen demand of the hypertrophied myocardial. Of course, historically, it was the availability of enzyme replacement therapy that led to the increased awareness and screening in the high-risk populations, like the ones with chronic kidney disease or left ventricular hypertrophy. When first studied in um, very selected populations of left ventricular hypertrophy screened in tertiary centers, there was an unexpectedly high Fabry disease prevalence, which was described in 1 up to 12% of the patients with a median of 3-4%. However, we know nowadays from very large cohorts of tens of thousands of less selected patients with left ventricular hypertrophy that the prevalence is much lower between 0.3 and 0.9% of these patients. Of course, the difficulty also comes that there are two phenotypes of the disease. There is one classical phenotype, the one everyone is thinking about when talking about Fabry disease, which is severe 
it is the one most often seen in men without residual enzyme activity and it evolves with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cardiac arrhythmia or conduction defects together with progressive renal failure which can lead to dialysis as well as stroke but there is also a non-classical phenotype which is significantly milder with a more variable disease course the disease manifestations may be limited to a single organ they can be isolated cardiac manifestations or renal or neurological manifestations and they can appear in men who have residual enzyme activity or in women of course the prognosis of patients with a classical phenotype and mostly of men in this situation is much worse than the prognosis of patients with a non-classical phenotype both men and mostly women with much better prognosis because it is well known that prognosis is linked to cardiac involvement and you can see here from data from um, one of the large uh, registries uh, up to nowadays of Fabry disease that in the natural history of these patients around 5% of them have major cardiovascular events but even more than that one third of the patients have cardiovascular comorbidities with a mean age for the first cardiovascular event around 45 years old for men and 53 years old for females in the untreated population but when you are a cardiology cardiologist you are usually in the situation of being in the echo lab or in another imaging modality uh, facility and to see a patient with important left ventricular hypertrophy you ask yourself if you should put a simple label of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or if you should further because we know now from the current guidelines for the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that besides the forms due to sarcomeric protein gene mutations which account for some more than half of the cases there are a significant number of patients who have what are now called phenocopies of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with left ventricular or b ventricular hypertrophy but due to inborn errors of metabolism and and the so Fabry disease is one of these situations or neuromuscular diseases mitochondrial causes amyloidosis or drug induced situations so very nice document elaborated by the working group uh, on myocardial and pericardial diseases of the european society of cardiology discusses the diagnostic workup in cardiomyopathies and proposes using a red flags approach meaning that when you have a patient with left ventricular hypertrophy you look at everything you can from family history to clinical features lab tests electrocardiogram echocardiography and cardiac mri to raise a reasonable suspicion on which you will base further diagnostic tests for more specific diseases and this will help you choose your treatment and the way the family screening is performed of course in an expert center for genetic cardiovascular diseases we always include in our anamnesis the pedigree of the patient in an x-linked disease a thorough pedigree will show us that affected males never transmit the disease to their sons but always transmit the disease to their daughters while affected mothers have a 50 percent chance to transmit the disease both to their sons and their daughters electrocardiogram is the following easy to perform test uh, in these patients and there are here as well some red flags one of them 
is the association between hypertrophy and the short PR interval, usually without a delta wave. Also, we should remember that electric left ventricular hypertrophy is the rule in Fabry disease, and if we ever find abnormally low voltages on the ECG, Fabry disease should be excluded, and we should think more about infiltrative diseases like amyloidosis. A prolonged QRS interval can occur in late forms, which can also be associated to other conduction disturbances or sinus bradycardia, and the need for pacing can occur in around 3-5% to of the patients. Cardiac arrhythmias can also become more frequent with the evolution of the disease, from atrial fibrillation to non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in more advanced disease, which can lead also to sudden cardiac death. Cardiac MRI is one of the imaging modalities of choice in Fabry cardiomyopathy. Of course, besides showing the expected left ventricular hypertrophy, it brings important structural information as localized fibrosis here in an anatomopathological specimen can be seen as delayed enhancement with a typical pattern involving the infralateral basal segments and sparing the subendocardial. Fibrosis can go from absent in some patients to mild and to severe fibrosis. And of course, it can also involve other segments, as in this case, where basal infralateral wall uh, fibrosis is associated to epical fibrosis in the patient. Of course, nowadays cardiac MRI can bring us even further information. The evolution of T1 mapping was essential for the ability to study the structural particularities of the myocardium even without contrast. And this is mostly important in patients with severe chronic kidney disease. In this respect, Fabry disease places itself at this part of the spectrum with low native T1 values around 1000 milliseconds and low extracellular volume. While, for example, another phenocopy, which is amyloidosis, is placed at the other end of the spectrum with high native T1 values and high extracellular volume. Biomarkers are a useful tool, especially as high sensitivity troponin T was proven to have a very good correlation to the presence of uh, and extent of uh, late gadolinium enhancement in the myocardium. This made troponin a convenient, cost-effective, and easy-to-determine biomarker, which can be used as a predictor of the progression of Fabry cardiomyopathy and can be helpful for staging and follow-up of Fabry patients. The association is not very strong for BNP, on the other hand. Echocardiography, the most used tool in um, uh, our uh, experience will associate concentric LV hypertrophy, which can, of course, mimic sarcomeric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or even hypertensive heart disease. It is usually a mild to moderate concentric hypertrophy, usually less than 20 millimeters. Usually non obstructive, but in our experience, as well as from other centers, there can be patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which proved to be Fabry disease. It can also be of asymmetric nature when the posterior wall becomes thinner due to fibrosis. If severe LV hypertrophy is found in the young, meaning a maximal wall thickness of more than 15 millimeters during adolescence, this usually excludes Fabry disease, as told earlier, 
this is a disease that become to begins to affect the tissues later in life. In more than two thirds of the cases, Fabric cardiomyopathy is a biventricular disease, adding right ventricular hypertrophy to the left ventricular involvement. A very nice and important observation is the papillary muscles hypertrophy, which was described a decade ago by the group of Frank Weidemann in um, Germany. It can be observed in a qualitative way just by eyeballing. You can see here, this is quite a prominent papillary muscle. But the authors also proposed a quantification method looking at the area of the papillary muscle in short axis and making a ratio to the circumference of the left ventricle. And they show that a cutoff of papillary muscle area of more than 3.6 squared centimeters can differentiate between Fabry disease and other causes of hypertrophy like Friedreich ataxia, hypertensive heart disease or amyloidosis where the contribution of the papillary muscles to uh, the overall LV mass was less important. Global function of the left ventricle is normal until late, but quite early the patients present with diastolic dysfunction, longitudinal global dysfunction as quantified both by velocities and strain, as well as radial dysfunction, mainly in the affected this was first um, shown in an interesting study looking at genotype positive, phenotype negative Fabry disease patients who already had, however, annular velocities of less than 10 centimeters per second with a very high sensitivity and specificity. We were talking earlier about the focal character of fibrosis and the preference for the basal left ventricular posterior wall, which can become in delayed uh, forms of the disease thin and fibrotic. We can easily see this with cardiac MRI, but as cardiac MRI is not always easily and readily available, it is very useful to use echocardiography, both conventional, but also the more advanced myocardial deformation techniques. And you can see here three examples of patients with no late gadolinium enhancement, mild gadolinium enhancement, and severe gadolinium enhancement. And while you can see the contrast taking in the right, you can also see it paralleled by a decrease in longitudinal strain in the corresponding segments. And the authors very elegantly showed that a segmental strain worse than minus 12.5%, closer to zero, in the basal postural lateral segments of the left ventricle has very high sensitivity and specificity for the presence of late gadolinium enhancement as you can also see here, appearing to be the best predictor. While if the segmental strain is normal in these segments, there would not be late gadolinium enhancement at Why is fibrosis important? Because it has been shown that patients with severe fibrosis at MRI have no cardiac response to enzyme replacement therapy as their mechanical function of the left ventricle does not improve, which is different from patients with no fibrosis who improve or mild fibrosis who remain at least stable. And this is also true for exercise capacity. Moreover, the presence of late gadolinium enhancement predicts further ventricular arrhythmias at long-term follow-up, as you can see in this graph. 
Of course, one question would be if this is only fibrosis. A recent study from the group of James Moon showed that the segments with late gadolinium enhancement also associate high T2 relaxation times, suggesting edema, inflammation, and labeling Fabry cardiomyopathy as not only a storage disease, but also a chronic inflammatory cardiomyopathy, which could become a target for therapy. Of course, final diagnosis needs the confirmation through both the enzymatic and the genetic test. If low alpha-galactosidase A and high lysogb 3 are found, the disease has to be confirmed by a mutation in the GLA gene. And this is mainly true for women because they can have normal or near normal levels of alpha-galactosidase A, usually, however, with elevated lysogb 3 Therefore, genetic testing is compulsory from the disease. To approach our conclusion, the red flags for Fabry cardiomyopathy can be cardiac and extracardiac. When we think about the cardiac tests, the ECG can show a combination of left ventricular hypertrophy and short PR interval. Echocardiography will describe not only LV hypertrophy, but also papillary muscle prominence as well as infralateral wall thinning with hyperechogenicity and reduced strain. Cardiac magnetic resonance imaging will find late gadolinium enhancement in the infralateral region. Non-cardiac red flags have also to be taken into consideration. One of them is the association of chronic kidney disease, even mild forms or just the presence of proteinuria, the association of neuropathic pain or impaired sweating, as well as the presence of angiokeratomas. Of course, that with our cardiac examination and imaging tests, we can establish the fulfillment of therapeutic cardiac goals for patients with Fabry disease, because we know we should look at the progression or stabilization of the left ventricular hypertrophy, of the fact that therapy should stabilize or prevent the progression of fibrosis using late gadolinium enhancement in MRI, and also to other parameters like arrhythmias or bradycardia, which should be addressed in line with current guidelines, but also with a special look at the risk of sudden cardiac death in these patients who can develop significant ventricular arrhythmias. Imaging will show us how the response to ERT uh, is developing. And you can see here a nice study showing that in patients who began their treatment before left ventricular hypertrophy occurred, there is no progression of the disease. And also if there is mild left ventricular hypertrophy at baseline below 13.5 millimeters, there is a very good chance of regression of this hypertrophy. However, this is not true for patients who begin therapy, enzyme replacement therapy, while already having a significant LV hypertrophy of more than 13, 14 millimeters. The regression of hypertrophy and the positive remodeling also are noted at the right ventricular. So to remember, from simple to unusual, Fabry cardiomyopathy can be diagnosed if LV hypertrophy is associated to chronic kidney disease, short PR interval, or a need for pacemaker, stroke, proteinuria, but also angiokeratoma, neuropathy, or cornea verticillata. The unusual forms of Fabry disease, but which should prompt us to test for it, 
if any of the red flags occurs, are hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy associated to AV block or to pacemakers in the family history, or very mild chronic kidney disease with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. To conclude, the diagnostic of fabric cardiomyopathy is an important step to ensure proper etiologic therapy. A red flex or puzzle approach is recommended based on clinical suspicion. While early diagnosis of cardiac involvement is very important in order to maximize the response to ERT.